uh, Craig go for today. So, uh, Craig, I can wait with you uh, to uh, a decade or so, at least, right? Yes, yeah, this is the initial uh, dark matter stuff. So, um, Greg actually got his, I think he got your under, undergraduate degree at Pepperford, <laughs> right? right. A long time ago. Long time ago. Um, so, he then uh, went to graduate school at Rutgers? Pennsylvania. Why did I think Rutgers? He works with My advisor is Okay, yeah, that's right. So, he got his, um, I screwed this up already, so it can only go, it can only go up from here. So, then he got a, a postdoc a fellowship at Harvard CFA. And then he got another fellowship to go to uh, KITP in Santa Barbara, where he's always had a nice view of the ocean. So I suggest that if you can go, if you can get a job there. Yes. Um, so okay. So then he went on to uh, after his second postdoc, he went on to take uh, sort of a position uh, at um, New York University, uh, working on various applications of what he learned through his uh, career in astronomy, uh, as some of which he'll talk to you about today. So uh, at this moment, he had a you know nice cushy position. Greenwich Village, did you have a nice brownstone apartment uh, somewhere? Not a brownstone, but okay. a beautiful apartment. Yeah. Okay, very good. But he gave that all up. I'm giving it <laughs> Gave it all up, <laughs> I tell you, uh, to accept a faculty position at the University of Delaware, uh, which is part in the Department of Public Policy, you said? Yeah. Part in the Department of Physics. So he is moving there um, on a tenure track position starting in uh, January, where he just told me one month as well. So right. congratulations to you all. Right. Right. Um, so today he's going to talk to us about um, a non-astronomical application of astronomical methods uh, that he uh, knows about. So, yes, go ahead. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here. This is my first time at AM. Uh, I've been back this many times, but this is my first time here. Really great space. It's been great talking to everybody. Uh, we'll talk to you more after this. Right. So, um, I am, uh, as Louis said, I'm at NYU right now. I'm at a place called the Center for Urban Science and Progress, or CUSP. Uh, where I will be for the next couple of months, and then I will continue to be affiliated with them after I move. Um, but CUSP, I'll give you a little bit of background about what CUSP is and sort of how I got there and things like that. Um, but my, uh, so what I do there is I'm the director of a facility um, that we're calling the Urban Observatory. Um, I'll describe, basically this whole talk is going to go through what that is and the kinds of things that it can do for cities. Um, I have some affiliation with the Department of Physics. A lot of what you're going to see here is not, so you're not going to see things like, you know, this is a fundamental law of this that we're trying to do. You're going to see a lot of um, techniques from physics and astronomy that are applied to problems uh, that can be, uh, that if solved, or at least if addressed, um, have the hope for maybe improving quality of life or improving functioning of cities. Okay? Happy to field questions during this, uh, during this talk. Um, let me give you a, a quick overview of what CUSP is. So CUSP, when I first joined CUSP, right, so uh, I was, as Louis said, I had a, a, long, a long career in astronomy. And uh, I decided to leave astronomy for uh, several reasons. Um, the biggest one was the fact that I wanted to do something that had more direct impact on people's lives, right? Uh, and so I didn't know exactly what I wanted that to be. Uh, so I looked around at a bunch of different things. Uh, the director of this new Center for Urban Science and Progress, which was just starting up, this was back in 2013, um, Steve Kudin, who's a physicist. And uh, so he and I had a couple of mutual acquaintances and he was telling me about, oh, we're starting up this new place. We're going to basically treat cities as a system and study them through data. Um, what can you do with that kind of thing? So I said, oh, well, you know, as, a, as an astronomer, we can do some imaging and how would that work and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but eventually he, uh, he convinced me that this might be a good thing to spend my time doing, uh, so I decided to go do that. So this was our mission statement. Um, but CUSP is this unique sort of center within NYU that's kind of a public-private academic hybrid. It was, uh, it was originally started with some, um, with some input from the Bloomberg administration a long time ago. Um, but the idea is um, that by sort of partnering with the city of New York, uh, we can use things, we can use data, and we can use data analysis techniques to improve quality of life of the citizens and improve the functioning of the city. I'll give a couple of examples of how we actually do that in very concrete terms uh, as I go through this. All right. We also have a uh, uh, we also have a master's program. Um, I'll put words up for most of this. I'll put words up, which you can read or you can listen to me. I'm not going to read them. Uh, where you can put. 
Um, we have a master's program where we're training, uh, where we're training students uh, to use some of the techniques, basically urban data scientists, uh, use techniques of data analysis, machine learning, statistics, things like that, applying them to uh, real world problems. Um, and they get a degree in urban informatics. So, you know, what is, what is urban informatics, right? So this is basically like, you have some data set, we'll talk through a lot of different examples of that. You have some data set about the city, um, and then there's a bunch of domains that that data set sort of hits, right? So um, for those who are not familiar with this kind of speak, which I definitely was not prior to five years ago, domains are like topics, right? So like transportation or energy or um, waste generation, um, climate, things like that, right? So you have a bunch of data about the city, you have a bunch of domains, and then there's these disciplines. So disciplines is how, uh, disciplines is how you do stuff, right? So like, um, what kind of mathematical model should I use to tackle this data to answer a question over here? Um, things like um, data manipulation, statistics, machine learning, all that kind of stuff falls under discipline, right? And so you throw that together and we, uh, we give out a, uh, a degree in urban informatics. Right, and so how did I wind up here? Uh, I gave you a little bit of the backstory. Um, <coughs> But let me, let me hold off for a second and tell you exactly what the concept was um, and tell you a little bit about cities first. So cities are complex systems, right? So uh, they are basically made of three components, the built structures, uh, the natural environment, and the humans that sort of inhabit these, right? So they're nicely separated in this picture. Uh, but in reality, those things are all sort of intertwined with each other, right? So, just to give you an example, right, these are the built structures, but there's all of these people inside of there using energy, doing things, pumping out air pollution from these buildings that are impacting the natural environment, right? So there's, there's this back and forth between all the different pieces of this. Uh, and that's really what sort of drives me and drives the kinds of things I'm interested in. There's also a very practical uh, aspect of things, which is that about 80% of the U.S. population and about 50% of the global population resides in cities. Um, as defined by the UN, I won't get too much into it. Um, but that number is increasing rapidly with time. So the city, the world is urbanizing very quickly, uh, and there's uh, there's lots of issues associated with that. So um, two quotes by physicists. Um, so Jeff West is a physicist who's at uh, the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. So he's done a lot. He's done some pioneering work in cities, and he has this great quote, which is that cities are the source of problems. Right. So you go there, you put all of these people together, and they start using up a bunch of resources. They start having impacts on things, and they generate things like, 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 uh, uh, like, like crime and air quality problems. Um, but then they're also the sources of solutions. So why is that the case? Because when you put people together and they start sharing ideas, they can generate solutions to these problems that are created. Right? So uh, going a little bit further back, uh, here's a quote by Aristotle. Uh, the person who invented physics, or the word physics anyway. Um, and uh, this is from his book on politics, not his book on physics. Uh, but he said, uh, to learn about a city, we must observe it. Okay? So that is what we decided to do. Um, so when I came to CUSP, uh, I wanted to basically take the methodology of astronomy and apply it to um, images of cities. And this is sort of qualitatively different from something called remote sensing, um, which is a very popular field in engineering. Um, where remote sensing relies a lot on things like um, very episodic observations, like maybe you take a satellite and you have a, an image of a place, and you take that once a month or once a week or something, and you look over time and say, oh, how is the city growing or something like that. How does that correlate to GDP? Um, what we want to do here is we want to study the city as a complex system, but to do that, we want to use high temporal granularity, high spatial granularity, and decent coverage. Right? So, um, the very, so the concept is very much like an astronomical observatory. Right? So in astronomy, you take pictures of the sky, and things are happening, and you have no control over what's happening, but you have to figure out what's going on just by sort of looking at pictures of the thing, right? So you can't go and make a modification to something, at least nothing that's not like quite local. Um, and, uh, and so you have to sort of just sort of figure it out, what's, what's happening. So in very much the same way, this urban observatory that we started uh, at CUSP 
um, treats the city as a system, but then uses observation of it remotely to try to figure out what's happening within that system. And in particular, to try to figure out the interplay between those three sort of fundamental components of the system. All right? So um, when I got there, CUSP had uh, five people, and uh, I was one of those people uh, doing sort of research work. We had 18 students. We've now grown to about uh, 40 researchers and about 100 students. Um, so when I got there, it was very much like the Wild West. And that was part of what attracted me to sort of moving on from Australia. I wanted to do something you know, fun and new that had an impact on people's lives. And was, you know, I would have joined a startup if I hadn't done this. In many ways, us was like, like a startup with an academic institution. So the very first thing I did was I went there and I said, OK, well, you know, if I'm going to do something where I'm operating in survey mode, like Sloan or units coming up or something like that. I want to put up a camera. I want to take continuous imaging. I want that imaging to get piped to a database. I want to do some kind of information extraction from those images, send those off to another database for analysis, right? And you'll see that that's exactly the kind of thing that, that went on. But what about the imaging itself? So this was like, not exactly first light, but close. Uh, so took just a simple USB camera, put it on top of a tall building in Brooklyn, uh, took a picture of Manhattan skyline far away, and then did that over time. So I'm about to show you a time lapse, a 24-hour time lapse. It's quite beautiful because all 24-hour time lapses are beautiful. Uh, and uh, but what I'm going to do is, because we had absolutely no idea of what kind of science would come out of this, right? So this was just a general concept. Can we look at cities and try to figure out what's going on in cities, or try to figure out the way that cities work by looking at them uh, remotely? Um, and so we said, okay, well, in a, in a very sort of uh, uh, Sloan-inspired way, right? So Sloan. Sloan started, and all of the all of the science drivers for Sloan happened. But then there were lots of other things, um, like satellite galaxies, for example, that kind of blossomed out of just running, just looking at the data and seeing what one could see. So our philosophy was very much like, well, let's take the data and see what happens. Maybe everything goes bust. Maybe it works well. So I'm going to show you this 24-hour time lapse. As I show it to you, I'm going to kind of talk through what you're seeing. Uh, in ways that are maybe indicative of the kinds of information that you might get from uh, from this kind of image. Okay, so here we go. So the first thing you notice is that there's lots of lights, like building lights and lights along the river. These lights along the river are, are reflecting off the water and splashing light pollution against uh, against some of the buildings along the riverfront. There's all these lights that are kind of twinkling in the skyline, right, as they turn on and off. Uh, you see things like signs in Times Square over here, right. You also can see street lights. Right? You see at some point at night, some of these big building lights turn off. Then the thing transitions to daytime, and you get a completely different set of phenomenology. As the sun goes overhead, you get uh, time-dependent shadowing right? that changes over the city, potentially important for things like solar power uh, viability. Uh, now you see cars along the road. right? You can see that kind of thing. You can see boats along the river. You can see there's a crane moving over here. You get clouds that go over. They cast a completely different kind of quasi-stochastic shadowing over the city. You see the sunlight reflecting off the Bank of America building, transitions to nighttime, uh, and then the whole thing starts all over again. Very similar to the beginning, right? So there's lots of, there's lots of information in time-dependent imaging like this that could potentially be useful uh, for addressing some problems if you know what the problem is. Right? So I'm going to talk through some of those uh, throughout the course of this. What's the sampling frequency on it? That was once every 10 seconds. Everything's second. Yeah. Right. So, um, how do we do this imaging? There's a bunch of words here you can read about that. Um, but basically, we do imaging in um, with three, broadly speaking, three different kinds of modalities. Something I'll call visible wavelength or visible broadband imaging. This is just like a camera on your phone, uh, except uh, the data is uh, much more sophisticated than it was when I first started. But it's basically connected to our servers in the back end. Uh, and three color imaging, red, green, and blue, okay? Uh, we also um, take imaging in infrared wavelengths, right? So infrared is great because it tells you about heat. So you can I won't talk too much about infrared uh, uh, observations here, but uh, you can do things like look at facades of buildings and compare the heat in the windows versus the facades. That can tell you something about the energy efficiency of the building, right? So building thermography on, uh, on very large scales. Um, but there's also other interesting applications, which I'll get to in a minute. And then, um, like any good astronomer, we also do spectroscopy. So I uh, have a couple of hyperspectral instruments. So these are basically uh, visible and near-infrared wavelengths. 
um, 0.4 to 1 microns with about uh, 850 spectral channels. Uh, lots of stuff you can learn about uh, with high resolution spectroscopy like that. Uh, we'll get into that. Then. Okay, but we have this sort of mantra at the Urban Observatory, which is persistent synoptic and granular imaging. Right, so um, let me go backwards. So granular meaning I want that high time resolution, I want that high spectral resolution, and I want reasonably high spatial resolution. I'll get back to that in a second. So that you know, if I'm doing if I'm doing satellite observations and I come back once a week, well, I miss a lot of that variability, the dynamics that's inside of the city, right? Uh, I'm also looking down at the thing, so I don't get quite the same vantage point. Um, but I also get much uh, much more coarse spatial resolution, a few meters. Uh, is, is sort of something people are pushing towards now, but typically it's much larger, uh, much, much larger pixelization than that. I uh, want synoptic. So one of the advantages of something like a satellite taking a picture of an area is that you get sort of large coverage, right? Um, so we, we sort of, uh, we get around that by putting our cameras on top of panning units, right? So these are sort of military-grade panning units that can last on top of, on top of a building in 100 or, or 10 degree weather. Um, and so you get sort of broad swaths of the city as you kind of pan across, right? So we want a synoptic view, meaning we want to get a lot of the city uh, in a single shot. Um, that video I showed you before had about a thousand buildings in it, and I'll tell you how I know that in a minute. And we also want persistent, right? So I showed you a 24-hour time lapse, and you can already see sort of there's a lot of variability, there's things changing, but how do things change on a, is there like a daily pattern? Is there a weekly pattern? Is there a monthly pattern? How do you identify variations in that pattern over time? Why would those variations be interesting? What about anomaly detection? Right? How do those kinds of things uh, play into things? Just like, you know, just like if you were doing an astronomical survey and you wanted to, say, find the day that was weird for a certain class of objects or the timing that's interesting for, uh, for some change in the data, right? That kind of thing you can also do with urban imaging here. To give you a bit of an idea about our vantage point, uh, and the kind of the amount of data that we're collecting, so CUSPs is here uh, in uh, downtown Brooklyn. These images from this one are from the first deployment, it kind of points up this way. Um, the camera was a 20 megapixel camera, so um, take an image every 10 seconds. We've now done this over many years, so we have huge, this is out of date now, uh, quite out of date, sorry. Um, we have huge data volumes, right? So we're roughly equivalent to a medium scale astronomical survey. Right? So we're not slowed, um, but we were maybe PTF or something. Right. Um, we now, this was the original deployment, we now have lots of other deployments. Um, this was a deployment that was done in Midtown Manhattan. I'm not going to talk too much about this project, so I'll just say it in words right here. So this was a deployment that was done uh, complementary facing, facing down. This is the view. Uh, as a video too, which looks like. This was a deployment that was done uh, with, um, in collaboration with the New York City Audubon Bird Conservancy Society. So I was giving a talk like this once, and there was somebody in the audience who was in avid bird watcher, and said, oh, you should talk to the New York City Audubon. They're really interested in lighting in the city because they want to know how it impacts migratory birds. Um, so this is getting towards that human-built natural interaction. What is the effect on local ecologies of humans using lighting in cities, right? So they're very interested in this kind of thing. So I said, oh, well, we can deploy a camera system and we can do that. So right now, we're working on a project with them where we're using this imaging, this image right here, to give a sense for what the, the lighting coming out of Lower Manhattan is, combining that with radar data, which tells you about where birds are to get a sense of whether or not this lighting attracts the birds, and what impact that has on bird fatalities. Very morbidly, they have a, a group of volunteers that walks around uh, looking for bird carcasses uh, in the morning to just count the number of dead birds around buildings. Right? So we're trying to combine this sort of um, <coughs> imaging, radar, and on the ground sort of field work kind of stuff. Uh, to get a sense for how lighting impacts migratory birds as they go to New York City. Okay? So that's just one example of the topic. Uh, as I said before, this is a lot like an astronomical survey. Uh, we have a data processing pipeline that takes in images like this and extracts useful information. In the case of the birds example, things like how bright is the city as a function of position. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that in a minute. Happy to field questions. Okay, so that's basically the data, how we collect it. So um, let's talk about some use cases of this and the kinds of things that you can use this data for. Um, the kinds of things that got me interested in doing like, stuff like this in the first place. Right? So um, let me first talk about some work that was done by, um, uh, by some folks who were at CUSP, uh, actually, so 
this is Constantine Contacosta, who is a uh, uh, faculty member at CUSP, along with uh, um, Josie Mora, who is a computer scientist at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and Richard Payne, who is a uh, urban planner at uh, Stanford now, I believe. Um, so basically, one of the things they did, there's lots of public records data. So one of the great things about using New York as the first place to do this, right? so before we start expanding to other cities, why would you want to use New York first? New York has lots of information about it, just records data that's been collected and <coughs> aggregated and put together. Um, a lot of credit has to go to Bloomberg for this. So he had this big like data and cities push, uh, and he sort of mandated that there would be data collection among the agencies and that they would all go to a central repository. So one of the things you can do, one of the data sets that exists out there is, what kind of fuel uh, do buildings in the cities use? Uh, because if you know what kind of fuel they use, are they burning heavy oils, et cetera, et cetera, you can do things like say whether or not that building is pumping out something called PM 2.5, which stands for particulate matter 2.5, where 2.5 is the size of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the size of the particulate, 2.5 microns. Very bad, has been shown to correlate with things like uh, uh, asthma and cancer, uh, et cetera. Um, also not something like that, right? So then you can use, they use a very simple model, right? So the sort of radially expanding Gaussian kind of thing, right? Anybody who does cosmic ray propagation or I, I, I did cosmic ray propagation for a while in models of galaxies and said, okay, well, if you have a bunch of sources, how do they do they sort of disperse? And you can do anisotropic diffusion or you can assume isotropic diffusion, all that. They assumed isotropic. The Green's functions are these radially expanding Gaussians, et cetera, et cetera. But you can say, for these sort of biggest buildings and these biggest sort of energy users that are using a certain kind of, uh, certain kind of um, uh, uh, fuel source, what is the impact on the surrounding buildings if these particulates are spreading, right? That's very great, um, but it is not the end of the story. Uh, and how do we know that? Well, let's look at these three images. This is basically like from that time lapse I showed you before, not exactly, but basically. This is 11 o'clock, this is 11 o'clock and 30 seconds, and this is 11.01 a.m., right? So to your, if you just looked at these, you would be very hard pressed to say what the difference is. Uh, there's a boat over there, right? And a wake. Um, but it's very hard to tell sort of what the difference is. So um, this was one of, the, one of the first things I tried. Um, using code, the exact same, so one of the, one of the last things I did while I was in astronomy was, um, uh, we did analysis of the Fermi gamma ray data, and we discovered these bubbles in the center of these big gamma ray bubbles in the center of the galaxy. Right? Um, prior to that, we had uh, we basically used the exact same code that we did for that to find a microwave excess in the center of the galaxy, and then we used that same code to identify the same microwave excess in the Planck data, lined up with the gamma ray data, multi wavelength observations of the haze or the bubbles or whatever you want to call them. Um, so using that exact same code. Uh, I took a time series of images and tried to basically remove the background, something that in computer science is called foreground background separation. So this is a raw image, and this is the image with the background subtracted. Okay. So um, in the example of the in the example of the bubbles, we were using multi wavelength information to build a model at a certain wavelength for what the sky should look like, subtracting that model, and you find an excess. That's basically how it happened, uh, with very little uh, with very little beyond that. Um, here you can do the exact same thing, only use time instead of wavelength. So you take a series of time sequence of images, and on pixel by pixel basis you build a model for what a certain frame should look like, and then you subtract that off the data and this is what you get. So things that change over time, right? So things like the cars moving by, you still see those, right? But things that don't change, like the buildings, they're basically gone, right? So if we do that frame by frame and look at a sequence of images, what do we see? Uh, we see the foreground, back, the background subtraction is working quite well. Um, but about halfway through this five minute video, you see that plume come out of that building. It's very hard to see. Uh, you can kind of see it if you squint right there. Um, but uh, so this was, uh, this was the first sort of, uh, this was the, the first sort of example uh, where we could identify dynamics that were happening in the city, right? So in those models where you saw the sort of, uh, where you saw the, the effects of a, uh, of a building using energy sort of diffusing uh, away radially, right? So that's clearly not happening here, right? This plume is flying off to the right. It's being affected away by winds, right? So um, if you were to, say, put a sensor or you were to live in a building right here, you don't care about that plume going off, right? Because of the wind conditions, right? So there's, there's, there's more to the story that you can get uh, when you use imaging. 
right? And so some of the, we've now updated this, we now have built neural network models that will uh, take these kinds of images and automatically try to identify these kinds of plumes and separate them from things like clouds going by or, or wakes in the water or cars going by. Um, uh, that is uh, uh, still forthcoming, but we have, uh, we have some models that will do that now. So there's all kinds of things you can do here, right? So if you were able to identify the buildings in the scene, you can do things like plume rate for an individual building, like the Peters. Uh, you can do plume rates for the whole city as a whole. So you can actually get direct measurements of what's being pumped into, into the air, which is very, very difficult to do right now. There's currently no real way to do that systematically across the whole city. Yes, what does it look like? Uh, this plume is a soot plume, so it's basically filled with things, carbon, there's carbon, there's PM2.5, um, this was, so, I'll tell you how I know this in a minute, uh, but this was basically somebody turned an oil boiler on in the morning when they turned the heat on, and the building burped out a puff of smoke. Well, if you can identify the building, you can ask them. Yes, you'd be surprised how tight the buildings are. Uh, the kinds of things they do. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll get to that in a second. We'll get to that in a second. Um, just like a good, any good astronomer, you can also do target of opportunity observations, right? So you see something happening, and then you take all of your other instruments, you say, wow, that's interesting, let me focus everything on that, and just observe the heck out of it and see, and see what I can get. Okay. All right, so why is this kind of thing interesting? Um, let me just put up everything. So, uh, you know, we do a lot of work with the uh, uh, city agencies of New York. So the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, they're charged with doing things like uh, um, uh, managing fuel types in buildings, how frequently they use, uh, those fuels are used, the impacts of those, they do a bunch of inspections. So they're in charge of oversight for things like oil boiling, right? Um, so periodically they will have constituents who send them pictures like this and say, my neighbor is doing this come out and do something about it, right? So they came to us and they said, okay, well, you know, can you use this, your urban observatory here to, you know, not maybe identify an individual building and send us in one place or another, but help us with this resource allocation, right? Which areas of the city should we be concentrating our efforts on? Are there areas of the city that things that are, that are, things that are happening that are worse than, than others, right? So, we, so we're not always chasing our tail all the time. So we're in the process right now of, of, of basically building an automated pipeline that will take in this image and say, okay, this region is where, you know, on Monday mornings things are particularly bad over here, or on Wednesday afternoon things are bad over here. Okay? An important point I'll make through all of this is that very explicitly, uh, we are not the cusp police. So we don't do things like say, that plume is coming out of that building, go get them. Right? So that's not, that's not us. Because you don't want to be that, or because you can't do that? Because we do not want to do that. I will show you that we could do that okay. right now, but uh, we do not want to do that. Okay, so clearly it would be very beneficial for scientific studies of all types um, if we could take that, uh, if we could take that scene and segment it in some way that allows us to say, okay, well this is this, this is that, and this is that. Right? Something like this is very hard, right? So. Um, even with a thousand grad students at my disposal, it would be almost impossible to draw boundaries around each of the buildings here and say, well, which pixels correspond to which building? Right? That would just be very, very difficult. Um, also, I would never put a thousand grad students through that torture. Um, but you couldn't even do it in principle, right? Um, it's very hard to do. Because um, there's, there's, I think in this scene, there is, I want to see. Let's say four, four thousand or so, four thousand or so buildings. Okay, I have tried source extractor uh, for many <laughs> different things. Um, one thing you'll notice quickly is that standard astronomical packages, and I'll get more into this in a second, fail spectacularly. Um, but also, um, I have, you know, I collaborate with a lot of different people in a lot of different disciplines, um, and also computer scientists, right? Among those are computer scientists. Um, who are very fond of saying that, oh, this problem was solved a long time ago. Uh, and there's standard packages out there, okay, well, take those. Those fail also for a bunch of different reasons, um, which we can get into, but um, we won't for now. Okay, um, so don't think I haven't tried, right? So, <laughs> all right, so, um, right, so how do we actually do it? Um, we use something called photogrammetry. Uh, among all the great data sets that New York has, 
uh, one of the things they wanted to do was um, do an assessment of um, uh, do an, uh, an assessment of uh, viability of solar power on buildings. So they did a flyover of New York, a LIDAR flyover. Those of you who are not familiar with LIDAR, uh, you fly over a helicopter, you take a laser, you shoot it at the city, it bounces back. So you know, you measure how long it takes to get back to you, so that you know how far away it is. So you get a bunch of these points to tell you which topography you make the city. Right. So, You can take all of that and sort of rasterize it or whatever. So now, this is just color coded by heights of buildings down here, taller, the fair taller, the still valley in here. Um, but this is actually very useful. Why is this useful? Because you can take this topography of the city and you can say, you can kind of, you could take this and say, well, what if I was taking a picture of that uh, from far away? And then you can say, okay, well, if I'm taking a picture of that from far away and I'm projecting this into a two dimensional plane, for a given <coughs> pixel, I can say which of these LiDAR points I'm actually hitting in this point file. Right? Once you actually know that, so now you know the XYZ location. So this is great because the XY location is the position on the Earth, the latitude and longitude. And there is a publicly available data set in New York called Pluto, stands for Primary Land Use Tax Lot Output, which are the tax lots of all of the buildings in New York and they're the tax lot footprints. So if you know the XYZ location of one of your pixels, you know the latitude and longitude, you know which tax lot that building falls into. So that's great because now you can go through every single pixel, as I just said, what I just said, and segment this image into the different buildings that are in the field. Right? So along some given pixel, I'm hitting some lighter point. That's at some latitude and longitude. There are, are all the building shapes on the ground uh, that you can then use to segment the image. Okay? Great. So for example, from this field of view right here, this is an overhead shot of all of the, this is that Pluto data set, this is all the tax lots uh, in lower, uh, lower Manhattan. And these are the tax lots we can actually see from that vantage point. Right, so our vantage point up here, these are the tax lots we can actually see. Why is there a big gray stripe right here? You can't see. Something in the Empire State Building. That's the Empire State Building, uh, which is not up here anymore. Right. So the Empire State Building is here and it's casting a long shadow over the over, over. Okay. Um, we can see those buildings from the other direction. So, which is why we're expanding to many different observational sites. So to give you an idea, once we have these kinds of things, so our, our friends at the Autobahn have their volunteers basically circling around uh, these buildings that are in red. These are buildings that are known to have high volumes. So you can do something like time-dependent lighting and time-dependent radar and time-dependent bird death and correlate those things in time. Okay. Much, more, much more effective than just taking a single snapshot and trying to make any kind of correlation. Okay. So, I showed you this picture before from the time lapse. These are the buildings we can actually see. I think there was that slice before, and these are the buildings we can actually see. So we can segment this building, uh, these buildings into, uh, into a bunch of different things. That primary land use tax lot output data set has lots of other interesting information in it, like is the, is the building a residential or commercial building? So you can take, there's no picture here now, right? This is just, uh, each pixel is color coded by whether it is a large or small residential or commercial building. Right? You can find data errors very easily. Right? So this is obviously not a small residential building. Turns out there's a very small residence on top, and so the building got zoned small residential, and that's why. So you can't have more than like you can have one building on multiple Pluto lots. Uh, one no one one Pluto lot per building. But a given building can be mixed use case. Right? A given building. Okay. So you can have you can have a bunch of storefronts on the bottom and. Oh, right. Okay. okay, so this is just to show you how this is working. Um, but then you can combine it with other. Oops. Then you can combine it with other stuff. Um, this is now color coded by information that comes from yet another New York City data set called Local Law 84. Local Law 84. There's this mandate that all buildings above 50,000 square feet in New York have to report how much annual energy usage they uh, consume. Uh, so this is now color coded, um, dark to light, by how much energy the building in that pixel used in 2000. Okay. So you have things like uh, hospitals, which are outliers, um, and very large spaces. Um, but now you can start to think about, well, maybe there's something I can observe that correlates with this, right? And we'll get into that in a minute. That tells me something that's a different sort of way of measuring this energy usage than, uh, than is being reported. The last thing I'll note here is there's yet another data set, um, which is the original one that we talked about, which is uh, talk, which uh, 
gives the kind of fuel that, or the, the way that a building uses energy. So all the buildings outlined in black burn heavy oils, and those are the ones that pump out those pollutants, right? So now, if you see a plume coming out of the building, you can say what the building is. So that Pluto data set includes things like the name of the owner of the building, uh, and uh, you can, uh, uh, you can sort of trace it back and say whether or not that building was burning heavy oils. So is it pumping out something that people don't want to breathe, or is it just a steam vent or something like that, right? And this is just the distribution of that. So where's Trump Tower? Trump Tower is... Had to ask. No, it's, uh, it's, it's up here. It's, uh, we, we cannot see it from here. It's a little bit too short to see from here. Uh, but it's, uh, it's in this space right now. Uh, Russia owns the most. All right, so right. So let's see that we did see a plume, and we wanted to do a targeted opportunity observation. And so we wanted to train some other instruments on that plume to figure out something about it. So there's a couple of different ways that you could use to get contents of plumes that we've talked about so far. One is you can use records data and tie things down and trace the plume back and say, ah, oh, that's burning a certain type of oil, so I have an idea of what's in there. Um, you can also use color. Right, so soot plumes are grayer and darker uh, in direct sunlight than, uh, than uh, steam vents, which are white, right? Whiter uh, steam, uh, whiter. The uh, the evolution of those things is different, right? So the way that the way that um, uh, the way that particulates diffuse is a little bit different than the way steam diffuses. Um, so you can make those uh, determinations. But maybe there's another way. So let me talk a little bit about. Uh, hyperspectral observations. So this was an instrument that we borrowed, uh, rented, didn't borrow it. They did, not, uh, they did not lend it to us through the goodness of their hearts. This was a, a very expensive instrument uh, that we rented just to do a field test to see how it worked. This we parked over here in Hoboken and took um, basically scans. So this is something like a single slit scanning spectrograph. So you have an instrument, the aperture is a vertical slit, it pans across the scene, it, uh, has, a, it has a diffraction gradient inside of it, uh, and then what lands on the uh, on the array uh, is either uh, is vertical information on one side, wavelength on the other, pans across so you get horizontal information. Okay. So this thing uh, this thing was planted out there. We couldn't put it in our previous site because uh, this one actually had to be cooled, uh, and uh, helium doers would not fit under a beam that was on the roof, so we put it over in, uh, in New Jersey. Um, so we get images like this. This is not integrated over all wavelengths. This is the western uh, side of Manhattan, uh, basically broadband infrared, and this is what's happening in the visible. So we can just pick 100 sort of random spec 100 sort of random spectra in there, and this is what you get. So this is uh, seven and a half to 13 and a half or so microns. So you have a nice black body peak. There's all sorts of chemicals in the atmosphere that are giving you little wiggles, but you get something like this, right? So you can build a model uh, to say, okay. Well, let me, let me do kind of like what I did before. Let me take my data, let me build a model for the expectation of what that data should look like, and then let me look at the difference of those two things. So this was a PCA model. Uh, basically, uh, you just you take all the different spectra, you get their principal components, uh, you, project them, uh, you project them back down, and then you get the model, and this is the residual. It's doing quite well, except for right here, where there's things, uh, where there's sort of saturation issues happening, right? But it all looks very good. Um, but this is broadband. This is integrated over all wavelengths. But what if we looked at one very specific wavelength, right? So now this is really getting analogous to how we uh, to how we uh, uh, found the bubbles in the first place. You get something like this. So this is 10.35. So this is the data. This is the PCA model, and this is the residual. So it works very well everywhere except right there, right? So that is also a plume, right? So and uh, there was a big discussion about where the spectral index of the, what was the spectral index of the synchrotron? Don't you know. Uh, I'm about to make a joke here about it. Do you have an excess in the inner? Yeah, there's an excess in, okay. the, in the inner part of the city, right? So, uh, or at least in our inner part of the city, right? Um, so but what does the spectrum, why is that, why is 10.35 microns uh, amazing? It's because the spectrum of ammonia has a sharp peak rate at 10.35 microns. So we not only have the fact that there is a plume there, but also that plume, the contents of that plume are ammonia, right? Now, because we want to do things persistently, we did that over eight days. Uh, here is a catalog of all the different kinds of stuff that we found coming out of the city. Uh, ammonia, carbon dioxide, methane, acetone, um, 
uh, Freon 22, which is uh, which is being phased out, so it's been highly regulated by the EPA. It's a canister, but it's just Freon 22. Um, right. So doing things like this, uh, it's just sort of like there's there's no way there's presently no way to get a good census of the kinds of chemicals that are coming out of the city. The way people do this now is you, you get an estimate for the kinds of resources that are going into a city, the kind of resources that are being used, and you estimate what's coming out. There's very little in terms of direct observations of these kinds of things, certainly not on short time scales, right? But the applications here are tremendous, right? So if you have, for example, um, a toxic materials release, say a building blows up, uh, which happened a few blocks from my house a couple of years ago. Somebody was stealing gas, building exploded. There was a plume of materials that were sort of drifting across the city. There was a lot of questions from um, uh, emergency management about whether the area needed to be evacuated. Well, here you can sort of observe a plume, get an idea of the contents of it, watch it move, because you know where, all the, where everything is in two-dimensional space, right? Because you can sort of project this down into two dimensions. You can then combine that with things like census data. Once you have two-dimensional data, you combine that with things like census data to say how many people are in an area, give a sense for how many folks need to be evacuated, all that kind of thing. So that's very practical from a sort of scientific complex system side of things as a function of the kinds of, the kinds of ways that buildings are built and maintained in an area. As people move around an area, how does their sort of environmental footprint beat against the time dependence of their use and the time dependence of their activity. Okay, so just to give you another example of, of how we can use this. So we said before, well, what if there was, you know, I put up that plot of the amount of energy use of, of the different buildings as a functional position in the image, right? And I said, well, what if we had some observable that we could use that correlated with energy use? Then maybe we could build something like a, um, uh, an, a remote energy meter, right? So say you want to, know how much energy is being used in the building. Let's say you want to know how much energy is being used in the city. That is not something that is presently known, certainly across multiple cities. So if you wanted to make some fun plot that was like energy use as a function of size to see if that was a linear function or log linear or something like that, there's just no way to make that measurement right now. Um, so you could put in a bunch of smart meters that has a lot of issues associated with it, but maybe you could develop something that is sort of a remote energy meter. So this work that we're doing is funded by the Department of Energy. We're trying to do exactly that. So here is uh, time-dependent broadband infrared imaging. So this is uh, t equals zero. Five minutes later, this is the difference. You see things like the steam vents and stuff and the reflections changing and all that. But there's one very interesting point uh, in this image, which is that guy right there, uh, which you can actually see in the right. You can see it brighter. So that pixel got a lot brighter over five minutes. So, you know, you can use the same sort of photogrammetry to project down in space and get the address of that. You can go to Google Maps and figure out exactly what that was. So, uh, so this is the building, and it was that right there. That's an HVAC vent. So when a building turns on heat or air conditioning, there's, there's vents at the top that vent out the hot air, right? Um, when it vents out the hot air, it gets hot. So that source, which is time dependent, which you can measure, the time dependence of, uh, is a signature of the energy use of that building, right? So this is this is every single, so this is on that spot, this is just off that spot, each one of these spikes, so this is the cadence, right? This is the duty cycle of the heating in that building. Right? So if you had ground truth energy consumption from that building, natural gas, whatever, um, you could build a model that essentially predicted that energy from these observables. What's the units on the line? The first, the second. Uh, these are arbitrary units. Right, so basically I have, everything here is done as a function of change of it, right? So, um, but one can measure absolute temperatures. You just need a, we did not have in this scene a calibrating source, uh, but you can have a calibrating source. Okay. All right. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, let me move on. We talked about the first thing I did, which was very astronomy. Um, but before I do that, uh, I have to talk briefly about privacy protections. So whenever you talk about taking images of the city at night from a side facing vantage point, privacy becomes a really big thing and you take privacy extremely seriously. So astronomers and physicists uh, probably don't have to deal with these things very much, but there's something called the Institutional Review Board at institutions and what they do is um, they oversee research that, um, uh, that is human subject research. Um, we went to the IRB board and said, this is what we want to do, tell us what we should do. They said, 
you know, this is not human subjects research because what you're doing is not collecting any personally identifiable information and nothing you're doing is changing behavior of anybody. Um, but we said, no, no, we want to go through the whole IRB process anyway. And what shook out of that is that all of our imaging, so I said before we want, we want spatially granular imaging, all of it is sufficiently not granular that we can't see into things like windows. So we have no information about the activity that's going on behind the given window. All we see is this sort of general diffuse blob of light coming out of it. And in fact, everything we do is integrated across an aperture, and everything is de-identified. There's no source that's traced across multiple data sets. And there is, by design of the instrument, no PII collection. Pro sorry, personally identifiable information collection. Okay, so, that's it. Here's the very first thing I did. I used this, and I tried Source Extractor to get all the brightnesses of all the lights in the building, because we saw all the lights twinkling, and I was like, hey, maybe there's a pattern there, maybe that's useful for something. In particular, maybe that pattern, which tells you something about the occupancy of a building, for example, right? And occupancy has been shown to be a very a strong correlate with the amount of energy being used in the building. Maybe those lighting patterns can tell us something about energy consumption in cities, right? So here's how it worked. Uh, source extractor failed miserably, so I went in by hand and I just, I drew 4,000 apertures on the scene. Um, took me three days, I'm not going to do that anymore, we have a bunch more clever ways of doing that now, um, based on temporal correlations of neighboring pixels and some models. Um, but here they are, so these are the four scenes, and these are the, kind, these are the, these are the 4,000 sources, and these are the kind of light curves you get out of those sources, right? So we see things going off and turning on and going off. And for a given source, you have absolutely no idea what's going on, right? So there are many scenarios that will fit exactly this, exactly this light curve, right? So, um, and we don't want to know what's going on back there. Because all we really care about is what is the activity, right? Because activity tells you something about the occupancy of the building, which might tell you about correlation. Right? So a person could come home, turn on two lights, turn off one, go to bed, wake up, go to the bathroom. Person could come home, turn all the lights on, leave, right? Come home and say, turn off an interior light, leave again. Come back home, turn on just the bathroom light, and then go to bed. Right? Anything could be happening. We don't know. We don't care. Um, what we're interested in is these things in aggregate. So aggregate patterns of activity, right? So this is now a thousand sort of residential sources divided up to the um, from uh, from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. You can see there's more lights on early at night than later at night. You can define this very special off transition, which maximizes the difference uh, in brightness before versus after. Right? And you can plop, plop those down there and you can say, is there a pattern? Is there a pattern to say when the lights are going off in the city? Because this looks very random to me right now. So just doing the simplest possible thing, ordering these by when they turn off, uh, there in fact is a very clear pattern. Right? So it's not random, if it was random, it would be a straight line. It has this nice curvature to it, right? so lights are preferentially going off around 11 o'clock at night. Right? And then you can start to ask sort of, well, you can start to ask sociological questions, because I, so, I have colleagues who are sociologists. Are people creatures of habit? So if I take this same sorting, the same ordering of when the lights turned off and go to the next night, do I get exactly the same aggregate pattern back? Right? It should look basically the same. Right? Uh, the answer is... So what you're saying is New York is not the city that never sleeps. Definitely not, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, the answer is that pattern breaks down almost immediately, right? So this, it, there's, um, the, the, the pattern breaks, uh, breaks up, this is a Monday, this is now a Tuesday, but using the same sorting as a Monday, and you, uh, you get this randomization from one night to the next. But then what if I say, well, forget about Tuesday. Uh, forget about Monday, what if I just concentrate on Tuesday? and order by Tuesday's off times, the answer is you get the same pattern back. So there's this repeated pattern that happens day after day after day after day, and week after week, and month after month, but the individual objects that make up that pattern don't strictly repeat. So it's like a gas, right? So there's a state, uh, and then there are these sort of individual particles that are, that are quasi-random within there uh, that are, that are uh, repeating, uh, causing a repeated pattern over time, right? So now, uh, there's tons of use cases that have come out from this. So things like building level load curves or electricity curves. So um, these patterns, how do they map to things like energy consumption if you use ground truth data. Um, circadian rhythms. So if this is a measure of the circadian rhythms of the population, there was a question here about when people go to bed. We can't say when they go to bed because we have absolutely no idea what's going on here. The person may have left, right? So they may not even be here. 
So we don't actually know on an individual basis, but there's a question of whether or not these actually map to circadian rhythms. And I'll show something about that in a minute. Patterns of life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So uh, just to quickly show you, um, this is over three weeks. We now have this over many years. Um, these are the offs, all of the offs, the big offs, all the ons, the big ons. This is the energy consumption for the buildings in the sea. You can see very similar patterns. So we're working on a project right now, again, from by DOE, that maps these kinds of patterns to the total energy consumption to build a model. Okay. So the question about sleep. There was this company, Jawbone, which I think is out of business now, which made these wearable fitness trackers, right? So they had a very interesting uh, blog post. They don't release their data. They had this very interesting blog post where uh, they plotted for a bunch of different cities. It's hard if you can't see it there. Um, the fraction of their users that are asleep as a function from 4 p.m. to 4 p.m. on just one random day, right? New York is the one in blue. And there was a whole big thing about how New York, the city that never sleeps, is actually further to the furthest to the left of all these other cities. So it actually goes to sleep first, right? Um, there's lots of other, there, yeah, there's lots of other sort of funny things about this, right? So, um, uh, this is totally anecdotal. So there's no, there's no, uh, uh, this is, this is just anecdotal. So in the, in the grand tradition of astroparticle physicists taking a picture of a plot and extracting <laughs> data from that plot, I've got the blue lines from this curve, <laughs> right? And I plotted, uh, basically the bottom left from 9 p.m. Uh, to 5 a.m. I took this from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, and I just plotted one on top of each other and they did that. Right? <laughs> so um, they actually, so this is constrained to go zero to one, whereas uh, the blue was not. So there's some minor differences, but they track each other very well. So even though we don't know and we don't care to know on an individual basis what's going on, the aggregate here is some circadian property of the population. So now you can look at things like circadian uh, rhythms, as which is, so I have some colleagues at the uh, Millennium Research Center. Up in Detroit, New York, uh, who are you know bona fide like uh, impacts of lighting on on circadian phase delay in people, right? So the question is, can you use imaging like this to look for changes in these patterns with the amount of light pollution falling on buildings, for example? Right? So these kinds of studies are usually done by doing surveys, and surveys have a lot of uh, sort of intrinsic biases associated with them. This is empirical, right? This is when this is happening. This is the amount of light people are being exposed to, etc. Does that really say Tokyo doesn't sleep at all? Is that the one that we're talking about? The orange one is Tokyo. Yeah. So they sleep at least in the time. Is that Yeah. That is the way to, yes. OK. Uh, one last thing before I end here, because I'm running short on time. So this is a hyperspectral view. Basically, this is what you've seen in the before. Uh, this is a hyperspectral view of Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, I just pointed to three to give you a sense. So this is a spectrograph that we own. Uh, I have a couple of them, actually. I just pointed to a few different pixels in the scene. The Empire State Building, the Powerwall sign here, uh, one of these trees. And you get things, uh, you get spectra that look like this, right? So this is an intensity as a function of, of wavelength from 400 to 1,000 nanometers. Um, all, kinds you can, all kinds of things you can see. Um, um, but these are all sort of very different. So one thing I won't talk about at all, because I'm very short on time. So this little bump here in the tree, around 700 uh, nanometers, so that's chlorophyll, actually. So it turns out that chlorophyll is very reflective as you go from the red to the near infrared. So the reflectivity has a little bump around 550, which is why trees are green. Uh, and then the reflectivity, there's this red edge. So the reflectivity increases very rapidly as you get towards 700. That's that bump. So one of the projects we have going on right now, again, the human natural connection, uh, is to look at time-dependent changes in that bump, which tells you about how healthy the plant is, right? Time-dependent changes in the chlorophyll, and correlations of that with local air quality measure, measured with in-situ air quality sensors. Right? So that's another, another sort of use case. Uh, to give you a sense of the kind of data we're collecting here, these are very large data cubes, quote, unquote, very large, 1,600 by 1,600 pixels by 850 uh, spectral channels. So we generate a lot of data in just a single scan, and we do that uh, continuously over time. Okay. So that was the daytime. What about nighttime? So here is a nighttime of the same thing. So this was the bridge over there, the Empire State Building, there's a the Powerball sign again. So um, right. So you have a lot before we're looking at sort of the colors of the different lights and their time dependent variability. So now what if I look at this uh, at multiple um, kind of multiple spectral channels? So there, so just to give you a sense of what the data looks like, uh, what do we see? Uh, the spectra of these lights looks like this. So this is the intensity again as a 
wavelength, you have all these sharp features, right, that are coming from the chemicals within the lights themselves. And those things, just like typing a galaxy, those things tell you exactly what that light is. So we can take a scene like this, we can take the spectra of all those lights, and we can tell you what every light in the scene is. Right? So is it an LED? Is it a high pressure sodium lamp? Uh, is it a fluorescent light bulb? Is it a metal halide? So for example, the uh, Manhattan Bridge over here, the necklace lights are LEDs. The cars going along the bridge have LED headlights, different kinds of LED headlights. There's a metal halide blaster light um, spotlight uh, that's up here to the bridge, etc. Um, these are interior lights uh, across the street in an NYU building. Those are all fluorescent lights within the building, for example. Right? So this is great for a bunch of different reasons. Um, there's all sorts of uh, use cases you can get off of this uh, that, um, uh, that we're currently looking at right now. So something like technology penetration, right? So we broke this scene up before. We were saying, oh, that building, that building is small residential versus large commercial, et cetera. Right? So I kind of alluded to it. But you can take, for example, because you know the latitude and longitude, the US census data has things like socioeconomic status and demographics. So you can say, as a function of things like socioeconomic status, um, are people preferentially using energy independent lighting versus not? Right? Something called the rebound effect, which has been hypothesized, but uh, never directly measured. There's been some talk about indirectly measuring it. But you could directly measure the rebound effect. What is the rebound effect? The rebound effect is basically the, I have LED lights, and so I leave them on all the time because it doesn't impact my electricity bill effect. Right? Um, so, uh, decreased efficiency of energy efficient technologies because of increased usage. Right? So we were measuring timings before, we can measure how long lights are on, we can measure what kind of light they are using hyperspectral scans. So we can say as a function of energy efficiency of the lighting technology isn't being used more or less. Right? So that's really end use energy is end use energy characteristics are really important for utility companies as they try to plan out how things are going to change over time. Right? So to that end, one can also use this to identify targets of inefficiency, right? So um, Con Edison, one of our partners, uh, the electricity provider for all of New York, right? They, their uh, power grid is stressed to capacity a couple of times each year on the hottest days. They have all kinds of, they've been told by the city of New York that they can't build their way out of this capacity problem despite the fact that the population of New York is set to increase by 10 or so percent over the next 10 years. Um, so how do you get out of that? Well, they offer a ton of incentives to buildings, right? So uh, if you use your generator at this time, we'll give you this off. If you upgrade your lighting, we'll give you this much off your electric bill, et cetera, et cetera. How do they find out what buildings to go after? Well, they go, they have a bunch of public records, and they try to figure out what kind of lighting the building has, and then they send out an inspector to do an energy audit, and then they look, and then those records may be inaccurate, and then they come back, and they assess, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of human hours go into doing that kind of thing. But here, we can just tell you what kinds of light the building is using. And because we can segment the scene, we can say these are the buildings that, that are sort of, sort of most ripe for, for some kind of upgrade to their lighting for energy safety. Okay. So I am out of time. So I will stop there. Um, happy to answer any questions. But just sort of the high level, the high level closing statements, right? So uh, for this, um, we've done our first sort of test case here in New York City deploying an urban observatory, collecting lots of data about the city from imaging, extracting information from that, just like an astronomical survey. Uh, I partner with a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds because I know nothing about any of these fields, and so it's really important to do that. Uh, in several cases, we're trying to take this technology and turn it into solutions for folks who actually, uh, who actually are, uh, whose job it is to run things and make things go smoothly. Uh, and really to the point here, we're sort of just scratching the surface of um, how the different parts of the city are interacting, right? So the high level science of cities. What is the, uh, what are the, what are the daily, the weekly, the monthly patterns of activity that we see in humans and cities? How does that change as a function of the built environment that they're surrounded in? How do those interactions between the humans and the built environment, things like light pollution, things like air pollution, impact the natural environment around the city, right? So, Understanding, once, once we can sort of get a sense of how those things work together, it's very analogous to like physiology, right? You can measure a bunch of things about a person. Uh, you can measure their blood pressure, you can measure their, uh, their respiratory rate, things like that. But until you sort of understand how the different systems are intertwined with each other, it's very hard to get a sense of, of the science of human body, right? Um, we're at the early stages of that now with cities. 
Um, but we're, we're expanding operations. As I move down to Delaware, we're going to deploy more sites in Philadelphia and Wilmington. Um, we'll start to be able to do some cross-city comparisons um, so we can say things like, how does technology penetrate in New York versus in other cities? Right? So um, that's the high-level pitch. Happy to have any questions. Um, thanks. Exactly like this in the city of Philadelphia and Boston. Um, some of the smaller cities, it's still a little sparse. Um, but one, and also the cost of the LiDAR flyover has not gone down significantly. So if you're a city that sees something that is potentially useful to you, uh, you might be able to do a LiDAR flyover for a few thousand dollars instead of um, how much it costs to do a LiDAR um, Each of those individual building footprints, so almost all cities have, have tax lot footprints, right? Those matters are partnering with the right people to get to that information. Not in all cities of the public, but for, for most cities of the information. The zoning information is really important. Go ahead. Okay. I have two questions. Um, yes. Your detectors, are they temperature regulated? Because if not, then some of your variability is going to be uh, as a function of your CCD temperature, right? That's absolutely correct. Uh, they are temperature regulated to a point. Uh -huh. So um, we mitigate things by looking for correlations with temperature because we have temperature measures. Uh -huh. okay. um, can, can you measure the um, ex horizontal extinction in the atmosphere, like magnitudes per kilometer? Uh, I'm interested to know that number. Yes. People who work on things like aerosol content of the air, right? You can do things like, as a function of wavelength, you can say, you can actually use measurements of wavelength, since you know how far apart your sources are, you can use extinction as a way to say the air, tell us something about the aerosol content of the air. Basically, visibility is a function of distance. Um, uh, wavelength dependent visibility. Yes. Yeah, offline, I'll tell you about yes. an experiment we did here. Absolutely. Uh, and we can do this over time. So we can do this you know, every few minutes, things can. So we just came off of uh, daylight savings time. Have you guys looked at the, the disruption in the circadian rhythms and how long it takes right. to establish that? So you may notice, uh, I don't know if I actually put the official dates here for privacy purposes because it had just happened. So we also do delays of releases. I did not. So these three, week, these three weeks travel daylight savings time. Um, Uh, let's just say that uh, that is still ongoing and still something that we're looking at. Um, if you want to see an effect like that, you don't want to do it once. Right? You don't want to take one observation. And so if you have one observation, you may see something, you may not. But in order to, you know, just like detecting a planet, you want to see a transit multiple times. So we're now getting on three, four years worth of observations, so we're just getting to the point where we can stay tuned. But uh, yeah, um, this is not the only kind of uh, only kind of data that we have though on the um, patterns of activity in cities related to human uh, uh, activity either. Right. So um, one thing I didn't have a chance to show is, you know, we want to just like with the sensors, like in situ sensing. Right. I said that we look at things like chlorophylls. It's a function of time and how that correlates with air quality using these two sensors. Um, we also want to know a little bit about human mobility. So we actually do combine this data with street level imaging 
a publicly available street level campus, right? which New York City has a lot of those. So you can do things like uh, anonymously, you no know, identification, just measure the number of people on the street in a bunch of different places over time and look for patterns in that, um, which we've also done and which may or may not also have uh, uh, changes as you cross daylight savings time transition. Sorry to be late. But we need the statistics and we're just getting that. Um, so when you're looking at the sort of the lights turning off the distribution function for that, does it, are there like individual buildings that seem to follow the like a different? Um, right. Um, I don't think I have the plot here, but so um, residential commercials, uh, residential buildings are different from commercial buildings. Weekends are very different from weekdays. Um, the number of transitions on weekends is also different from weekdays. Uh, one thing I will say uh, is that it's fascinating to me that if you sort of see this behavior, kind of hard to see in such, only in such a small period of time, but you see this behavior where you have these strong peaks and then the dip down to the weekends and Fridays kind of look like maybe they're transition to the weekend. The same thing is true in energy consumption. The same thing is true in the number of people on the street. So there's this like weekend, weekday behavior that sort of exists across multiple data sets. Uh, it's very fascinating. Um, there are individual buildings which, which look very different. Um, the commercial buildings especially have a lot of variability that's kind of very, that's very funky that you maybe wouldn't, or maybe you wouldn't think of at first blush. So things like when cleaning crews go through and a whole floor lights up, right? Or and there's a couple, I don't know, I don't think these videos have it. We will go back to it. Um, that's hard to find maybe. But uh, as the cleaning crew goes through one of the floors in the Empire State Building, you can actually see chunks of lights going on, right? And wrap around the whole. <laughs> Um, so you see stuff like that. So there's, there are kind of weird patterns on individual um, bases, but um, the variability from one building to the next uh, residentially, the patterns there are very interesting, and there are some changes. And so the question is, does that correlate with things like light pollution? Does that correlate with things like noise pollution? So one of the other publicly available data sets in New York City is the 311 call in data. So 911 you call for emergencies, 311 you call to complain about stuff. And uh, the number one complaint in the city is noise. So um, is there variability in the lighting as a function of how many noise complaints there are in the area? Right. So, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the Empire State Building. Um, 